my involvement in aviation. Um, June marked my 30th year. So uh, it was kind of, uh, where did that time go? I have no idea. I, in those 30 years, have earned my ATP rating. I'm also commercial single engine and land and sea. I'm a certified flight instructor and uh, currently work also as a DPE, which is a designated pilot examiner. So, sort of like a Czech airman. Uh, any, anybody <coughs> here in San Diego, training at any of the local schools, uh, getting their private license, their instrument, or commercial, have to pass a check ride. So uh, the FAA, uh, the FISDO here in San Diego, has designated about 10 of us to administer uh, those, uh, those tests. So I'm privileged to, to work uh, as a DPE here in San Diego. Um, I have thousands of hours teaching, uh, and I've been teaching uh, since 1987. Uh, amongst some of the people I have taught have, of course, my daughter, my son, and my husband. So uh, we are a, a family of, of pilots, and uh, I don't think you can go a day, it's just aviation speak in the house. Uh, the kids grew up with it. Uh, as, when they were young, I used to just keep telling them, it would be really dumb not to get your private pilot license when your mom is an instructor and has her own plane to teach you in. So I just kind of always just threw that out at them, right? So uh, in the hopes that they would they would uh, catch the bug like I did or, or my husband who is also a commercial air pilot. Uh, and they did it. They, they, they followed through. They, they've flown off and on uh, since they were babies, really. And uh, it's it's been it's been a, a fun adventure. Um, I'm often asked how did I get into aviation in the first place, and um, I, I have to come to say that it must have been in my blood. Um, I was enthralled at a young age uh, with the thought of flight, but probably not for the typical reasons. I can distinctly remember I was probably about five, six years old. We, lived in Texas at the time, and Texas is home to fantastic uh, thunderstorms and fa fantastic cloud buildups. And, and as kids, we would watch these wonderful, puffy clouds floating through the sky. And, and as a young child, I was fairly certain that those beautiful clouds, which so resembled cotton candy, that I think I was on to something. I'm like, I needed to get some cloud, I needed to eat that cloud, and probably hit the mecca of cotton candy in the sky. So my father was a pilot. He flew for the Border Patrol in the 60s and the 70s, and uh, I, I came up to him and I said, I need you to bring me home some cloud. So I'm guessing he said, okay, I'm not really sure. He came back from his, his, uh, his, his trip, he was gone, uh, for many weeks, he was part of the airlift program back in the late 60s where they actually flew the aliens back to their home countries. So he was gone four or five weeks at a time. He came back, I'm like, where's my cloud? And he's like, I did not have a container to put the cloud into. That did not stop me. Um, I promptly got him a jar with a good lid and uh, clearly told him, when you're up there in the clouds, open up the window, scoop me out some cloud, and bring it home to me. Uh, unfortunately, that's where my memory ends of that story. I don't know how. I'm sure he wisely got out of, uh, out of that cloud story somehow. Um, flash forward probably about eight years. Now we're living in San Diego, and my father is now flying uh, for the Border Patrol here in, right out of Brownfield, and they're flying just Super Cubs now. And so they are patrolling the border, and we live in Bonita, so we're just not that far away. And oftentimes he would come and circle our house. Well, we just thought that was fantastic. We'd all come out waving and, and cheering. And, and uh, on, an, on a few occasions, he would sneak up on us and then use the PA system. <laughs> and the whole neighborhood would know. It was, it was, you know, it was just a lot of fun. It would scare my mom. She'd come running out, and, and uh, you know, we'd be waving. 
But um, at that point, I'm about 12, 13, 14 years old. I'm like, hey, Dad, take me for a flight in that plane. It's like, oh, man, that is against the rules. And I'm like, well, not knowing anything about the aircraft, I'm like, don't worry. I will hide under the dash. I'm thinking kind of like a car, right? I'll hide under the dashboard. No one will see me. It's like, oh, unfortunately, it truly is against the rules. It's a government plane, and I, and I can't, you know, I can't take you, can't take you up. Well, unfortunately, we flash forward just a couple more years, and and uh, my father is uh, uh, diagnosed with terminal cancer, and passes away when I'm 18 years old, and I never had the opportunity to fly with them. Um, got busy with college, graduated college, and again, four or five years later here, I'm, I'm just barely 21, and, and I see a, an aircraft, an airliner, coming in for approach to Lindbergh. And I'm like, oh, how does that happen? How does something so amazingly large, so heavy, get off the ground. And it came back, I have got to learn how to fly. I just have to. So um, I approached my mom, who her backstory is white knuckle flyer. You could not even get her on the, the commercial uh, aircraft. She, she hated flying, even though she was married 30 years to a pilot. Um, so she was a little taken aback. She made me write a, write a, a, a a letter why I wanted to become a pilot. And uh, then she got one of my father's uh, pilot friends to read over that letter and kind of drill me on, you know, what is my intention? What, what, am, I, what am I doing here wanting to, to learn how to fly? I, I, I guess I passed that because my mom drove me out to Brownfield Airport. And uh, as, as life is, and we're so interconnected, uh, Flying J Aviation was the FBO that, while well, my father was flying, <coughs> maintained all the planes. So they knew him and loved him dearly, and now his daughter is coming out to, to learn how to fly. So uh, I was immediately embraced. I was immediately in a, in a fantastic family situation out at the airport. And uh, my flight instructor, uh, a good guy and, and guided me through this process. I, I didn't even, I didn't know you got a private pilot license. I was just going out to learn. And, and I, I learned along the way that you get a private, you get an instrument, you get a commercial, then you get your CFI, then you earn your time, and then you fly for the airlines. I, I didn't know that. I, I learned as, uh, as we went, uh, went on. I remember distinctly my first flight. We were in a little 150. And we were rumbling down the runway there at Brownfield, and we had just rotated. And my instructor hears a noise, and he starts tapping on the instrument panel. And I thought, oh, well, you know, here it is. It's over. At, at least I tried. And you know, for that split 30 seconds, it was like heart rendering. I don't know to this day what it was. <coughs> we continued flying, and uh, 12 lessons later, uh, I was soloing that very aircraft. Um, got more solo time in, did my first solo cross country, it was uneventful. Went to do my second solo cross country, which was uh, supposed to be from Brownfield out to 29 Palms. And uh, well, I got past the Palm Springs Valley and forgot to take that left to 29 Palms and continued eastbound for quite a while. I'm thinking to myself, this is not good. I, 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 I've missed my turn. What am I going to do? And as luck would have it, I'm like, I see a number of little planes. They seem to be flying down this little valley. I'm going to follow those planes. So I followed those planes into this little valley. And lo and behold, uh, ran into Bullhead City. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and, and the beautiful little runway there, and, and landed and uh, called my uh, poor flight instructor, who was probably aged about 50 years since I was way behind time at that point, um, and uh, actually managed myself back to 29 Palms and, and home again. But uh, it was a little bit uh, unnerving, without a doubt. 
I started, again, my first flight was June uh, 23rd, 1985, and I was teaching January of 1987. So in a year and a half, I went through all the necessary licenses and ratings and started teaching with a mere 200 hours, which is just pretty unusual. It's, it, it, even to this day, it's, it's humongously rare. Um, but uh, I, I certainly, again, I felt like it, was, it had to have been in my blood because I was just addicted, even with, even with a few scary situations in between time, and, and uh, it, didn't, it didn't deter me. Now, that was a lot of flying to do in a short period of time, and where did the money come from? So again, I had just graduated college and when I decided to do this flying, so I went up to my mom and I said, eh, can I live at home rent free, please? I would like to pursue this. Of course, she had no problems with that. That was an absolute yes. And uh, down in Chula Vista, very close to Benita, a new restaurant had just opened up. It was called Burry Calendars. So I went down there, got a job. I very, actually, my very first, I call it my first real job. Uh, I grew up riding horses and, and so uh, made all my mad money uh, training horses and giving riding lessons. But this was my first, eh, I have to punch a time clock kind of, kind of job. But it was perfect. It enabled me to work at night and then go out to the airport and fly during the day. The other good thing about Marie Calendars was that's where I met my future husband. So uh, uh, we got introduced and uh, missed my training. I'm like, hey, come fly with me. So here's this surfer boy from Del Mar, also never been in a small aircraft. But hey, he's not going to turn down his girlfriend's opportunity to go fly. He, he, one of his first flights we took was um, a long flight out to Chandler, Arizona. It was a requirement for my commercial license. He was like this the whole way, <laughs> and by the time he got back, was pretty worn out. But you know what? It didn't. It didn't stop him. He's like, you know what? I have to learn how to fly. So uh, I I got him solo before we were married in 1987. He soloed, and then shortly after uh, we were married, he got his private pilot license. And this is 1988. Um, now at this point, I'm like, hey, maybe I should check out the airline, see what's going on. See figure out how to, how to go that path. So uh, there was a lot of seminars out there to help you um, transition from civilian to, to, to the airlines. Because at, back then, most of the airline pilots came from the military. You didn't see, you didn't see civilian walking into, into the airline jobs. It was just, you know, just didn't happen. It was, it was an expensive way to, to do it, civilian way. And the military pilots came with all, all the amazing experience and, and experience in the jets and, and all that. So this is starting to change, though, in the late 80s. We're not seeing the military pilots leave as much. Um, and so yeah, we need to push the civilian pilots into, into these careers. So a lot of seminars out there to help you, a lot of books, how to, how to pass your, your interview, um, et cetera. So we went to this one seminar. My husband went with me. And we're sitting after you know one boring, one boring speech after another, and then this gentleman comes up and he's doing some crazy little uh, uh, magic act, and it kind of perks everybody up, and, and we're paying attention. It turns out um, he he is also uh, a husband to a formerly fired air traffic controller. Remember Reagan fired all the air traffic controllers who went on strike in. 80 or uh, 81 or 82, so, so, somewhere in the 80s. So he is also teaching a class on how to prepare and pass the written exam for air traffic control. Back then, what they did, because now they needed to hire air traffic controllers like crazy, they, they fired all of them, right? And so what the FAA was doing was you took this test. If you passed well enough in this test, then you were, went to Oklahoma City for a six-month screen. So again, my husband, the last couple of years, he's been introduced to aviation. He's like, you know, this air traffic control stuff sounds really exciting. So we've, we got in touch with this gentleman. Long story short, you had to get a 98% or better on the written 
to be considered to go over to Oklahoma for the traffic control class. He got 100%, yay, he's in. So um, I'm applying for my jobs. I got a offer in, uh, for uh, Midway Airlines, Midway Commuter Airlines out in Chicago. I left January 1991 for Chicago. My husband left February, same year, for Oklahoma City for their traffic control um, uh, uh, six month screen there. So we're, you know, we're like, hey, it's an adventure, right? We can make it, we can make it work. Um, flying for Midway uh, Commuter Airlines was absolutely a blast. It was a, a, a fun and exciting uh, time in my life. Uh, very eye-opening. Uh, for the most part, I'm a San Diego girl living in San Diego weather. And now I'm in the heart of, I'm in Chicago. I'm in some really amazingly horrible <laughs> weather. And uh, certainly uh, had a number of eye-opening, eye-popping experiences. My very, very, very first day online, we're flying. Uh, we flew a Dornier 228. It's a 19-seat passenger uh, turboprop aircraft. And we were flying from Springfield into Midway. It's not a very long flight. We're coming over the lake, and we pick up two inches of ice. And we're popping the boots like crazy. And we're full power just to make it to the runway. Ignorance is bliss. I'm thinking this is fantastic. And uh, you know, we made it no problems. It wasn't until the summer when I realized that when we normally shoot that approach, we shoot it at idle, not at full power. Um, we, uh, as a first officer, one of our jobs was to be the last person aboard the plane in 90% in of the time. Uh, sometimes weather would, would change that. One, one day, uh, again, weather's miserable, flights are being canceled, passengers are just frazzled. Uh, all the planes that, you know, the flights that are still going are loaded. So our flight is just, we're, we're to max. And we've got all these people loaded. They've probably been sitting in the airport for six hours. They're tired. They want to get going on their way. And of course, I'm the last one in. Now, you can't see my uniform because I've, I've got a coat that goes from here down to the ground because of the weather. And I'm starting to climb up the stairs and ready to turn around to close that, close the, uh, uh, the door and this woman sitting there you know she's had a hard hard day and she looks at me and she screams at me and she's like there is no room in here for you <laughs> and I can only imagine she was you know oh my god they've overbooked the plane now they're gonna have to take everybody out and figure out <laughs> where they're gonna do with this 20th passenger I very calmly I looked at her I said you know what it's okay I have a seat up front. And she just kind of stared at me. I locked the door, and everything was good. Uh, but we had such great experiences uh, at, at Midway. Um, early on, the, uh, probably the second or third flight I'm flying, the captain looks over to me. He's like, so, he goes, you ready for the landing contest? I'm like, landing contest? Sure. You say contest to me, and, and I'm there. Um, I'm, uh, I'm up for any kind of competition. Um, so he's like, OK. And he takes this penny out of his pocket, a penny. And up on the instrument uh, panel there, a little ledge you know, from a, maybe a radio poking out a little bit. And he puts that penny on its edge. He's like, OK, this is the contest. Whoever can land without having that penny fall. I'm thinking, ooh, this is going to be interesting, right? Uh, so he's like, you can go first. I'm like, OK. Uh, so needless to say, my first landing, that penny ricocheted all over that cockpit. I'm like, oh, man, all right, game on. I know how to do this. That was the only time that penny budged. And if we would do that landing contest, that penny would never move, which made me uh, probably uh, uh, hard when I'm a, as a teacher teaching landings because you know what? You can land very smoothly. You can land very well 
each and every time. And I think that was just driven home because it was such an exciting moment to be actually being able to touch down this big, huge, heavy aircraft and not have a silly little penny on its, on its edge uh, fall over. Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, that uh, didn't last long midway. The uh, first uh, the Persian Gulf War uh, started. Price of gas went through the roof. And we're seeing airlines uh, furloughing pilots. They're trying to cut costs now. Then we're seeing a lot of bankruptcies going on. And unfortunately, uh, and Midway had just bought a new hub in Pittsburgh. We were so excited. We were expanding. And boom, our airline went bankrupt. So I am been given my furlough papers. Six months later, or you know, we're in July now. My husband is literally down to his last week of this most strenuous and, and to put it politely, just awful six-month experience at the screen. And you, you know, you spent six months of your life, and it's not until the last exam that you know, are you actually going to make it or not? And they had a really high uh, failure rate. So we're sitting there going, wow, I'm living in Chicago, you're living in Oklahoma, and we're both about ready to be jobless. Uh, but needless to say, he, he made it through ATC. His first uh, tower was up in the Bay Area, Hayward. So we ended up moving to, uh, to, 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 uh, to San Francisco area. Uh, I aggressively attempted to try to find work out there, but um, there was just a glut of pilots now. And uh, getting on, uh, even with another commuter airline, was just not happening. We were just seeing too many bankruptcies, too much, uh, too much, too much furlough, all this. So that's okay. I go back to instructing again, and uh, we go a couple of years, and uh, it's 1993. We actually went back in San Diego. My husband was working at Brown Field, and um, I'm pregnant with my first baby, and I am still teaching, and teaching and still teaching. I am seven months pregnant, and I think back and I go, uh, what wonderful spirits all those uh, students I had. And, and, and certainly back then, all my students were males, and they were all 30 and above. And they're having this, uh, I, I, was, I would say tiny little girl teaching them, but um, I was as big as a house at seven months pregnant. <laughs> uh, but I didn't think twice about it. My doctor was like, hey, you've been doing it your whole life. Just whatever it is what it is until you feel like The owner of the company finally came to me, a fantastic woman, 85-year-old, Mrs. Jones. She ran the school and her two sons. They were the mechanics. It was, again, I'm back to, this, the, I'm back to where I, I learned how to fly. I'm back, back teaching for them. And she very delicately asked me if I wouldn't mind Stop flying until the baby came, and she would give me work in the office. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I, I can do that. That, that makes sense. So uh, Leah, she was flying before she was even born. <laughs> she, she, had, she had no choice. As much as I may have brainwashed her, she had no choice. Uh, she, she was destined to, to fly. I would, uh, you know, shortly after I had her, again, my husband was working at Brown. I'd take her. We'd do book work in the morning. When my husband got off from work, he'd come pick her up, take her home, I'd go and do a couple lessons. So, so we kind of, we worked it out, I, I, I continued with that. Uh, we flash forward a few more years, we've added another baby, uh, her, her brother, and um, we've moved, we've moved to Monterey, we're, we've worked at a different facility, and, and, and now we're back again, and it's time for me to uh, open up my own business, and that's what I did. So I went to Ramona Airport and um, had my own little flight school there and, and started uh, a great deal of, of, of intense flight training. Uh, the kids, they're growing up, uh, they're getting older. I think both of them started lessons in high school, but they were both just so amazingly active in their own uh, uh, sports and ASB that we never really could quite finish their licenses. Uh, when they were in high school and kind of had to wait till they were in college and they had some time. But so we did take a few family trips. Uh, one family trip, which was, uh, I think, I don't want to say it was a turning point, but it was definitely a, um, 
uh, a bonus for my son. He, he, my husband and I decided, let's go and get our seaplane ratings. Let's go do something really super fun in aviation. And I'll tell you, there was nothing, uh, that was so enjoyable. We flew up and down the Colorado River, just touching, going back, uh, back and up in this beautiful Super Cub uh, seaplane. And uh, it, it was an amazing experience. Uh, we were there during the Thanksgiving weekend. And uh, this is the last day we were there. My husband was off taking his check ride. So I'm waiting alongside the, the shore, watching him, and anxious. And my son is there. And you know, in the back of my eyes, I can see there's, you know, there's some activity going on. There's people kind of running back and forth. But I'm kind of focused on my, my husband. And, Pretty soon I'm like, you know, my son is not here anymore. He's about 15 years old. I'm not that worried about him, but he's, you know, he's, he's, he's not here. He's not standing by me anymore. More activity going on. I see my husband. He's taxiing back in. I'm like, well, you know what? He's okay. I think I better go check and see what happened to my son. So I follow the activity, and uh, my son, while he was watching his father taking off and stuff, there's, there's jet skiers. It's the Colorado River. And he sees this one jet ski with three women capsized. And they're not doing well. So uh, he ends up into the river. And well, long story short, it, you know, comes up to the boat. And it's a 70-year-old mom, a 44-year-old mother, and a 12-year-old girl. And none of them know how to swim. <laughs> nor do they speak English. He was able to hang on to grandma because she wasn't doing so good and eventually get them over to the shore and up the bank and, and, and by the time he had them um, up the bank and walking down the road is when the emergency uh, uh, personnel arrived. So you know I think it was a good thing that he was there. <laughs> uh, it was certainly was a feather in his cap. He's an avid Boy Scout at that point so he, he takes his Boy Scout duties very seriously, and he knew exactly what to do. He went on to earn his Eagle Scout. He also was awarded a, 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 a I don't know, I can't remember what it was called, a badge of honor or, or life. It was a special honor through the, through the Boy Scouts, but the National Boy Scouts, not the local level. And um, my son, who, again, had the aviation bug at a very early age. He would sit there behind the Microsoft and go, hey, I just landed a 747 in Hawaii. I'm like, oh, that's great, son. Uh, so he could name every, every World War II plane and its compliments, and, and he just really ate that stuff up. Uh, he did find out, though, unfortunately, um, a few years ago, that he was colorblind. So the aspiration of, of, of you know, perhaps a military flying was squashed a bit there. But he pursued, he received the congressional nomination from Duncan Hunter and uh, ended up getting a full ride ROTC, Army ROTC scholarship and is attending uh, Embry Riddle. And he did get his private pilot license this June. So uh, he finished that leap and, and is also a pilot. Um, I have seen so much change in, in my 30 years for, uh, for aviation, for the civilians in aviation. Again, when I started, it was, it was tough to get on. Um, it, it, you really had to set yourself apart. And now we flash forward and, and we actually have such an amazing need for pilots. Um, the commuter airlines can't keep them hired long enough they're moving on into the majors. What's interesting, though, and, and where some of this problem is, is the cost. So when I was learning how to fly, I paid $28 an hour for a plane, $12 for an instructor. So 40 bucks an hour, right? Now, I, albeit that was 85, that was still a fair, fair amount of money. Minimum wage is only $3. Uh, today, Average cost of an aircraft, average, which means you could get a lot higher, 120 an hour and 65 for the instructor. So we're looking at you know, $185 an hour as opposed to 40. And um, and a lot more things to learn. 
we have um, standards, uh, we call it the practical test standards. The FAA has set aside, hey, you need to teach this, this, and this, and this. And where they haven't really changed the hours much, they have added to that list. So, so really the number of hours to get through this has also increased. So you're looking at spending thousands upon thousands of dollars. I probably did all my flight training uh, under 10 grand, and nowadays the kids are looking at, oh, somewhere's around 70. Then it gets worse. Now you get your job. When I was uh, hired on with Midway, I was earning $14,000 a year, which even back then was not that spectacular. But for the time, building that I was getting, it was okay. 30 years later, $18,000 to 24, starting. Barely, barely a livable wage there, right? You really have to live, live with mom and dad <laughs> um, to try to make that work. So again, we're seeing a great need of pilots, but the pilots are going, I, I can barely afford the training, and then when I get my job, I still can't afford to live. So it's really, it's really a, a challenging situation. Um, I had written down some uh, stats where the first five years you're maybe making, I think I have it written down, zero to five years, okay, so the top wage around 55. Five to 10 years, okay, now we're getting into the 92 range, but you've put in up to 10 years. Uh, the 10 to 20 years, now you're starting to finally be around 135, okay? Um, and then once you're 20 years and above, you've got a lot of seniority, you might be into the $180,000 range. So you've got a lot of years to put in um, to get to get to some reasonable wages. So um, it's definitely a young person's uh, a young person's game where they can do it. They can perhaps uh, uh, live at home, live cheaply, so that they can afford this kind of kind of thing. Scholarships are big. I've had a number of students who have worked really uh, hard with making their resumes looking nice. They've got scholarships through the 99s, uh, which are a big, uh, big women's organization, but there's other outside organizations. Uh, the AOPA is realizing uh, now that uh, we need to, to help these wannabe pilots out and give them through some of this flight training. And, um, uh, I have uh, a few, in fact, uh, one young lady who took a flight with Carl at Young Eagles Meadow, and she soon became one of my students and uh, achieved her private pilot license. She also got her four-year degree in aviation, and she's working now as an assistant manager at Ramona and Fallbrook Airports. So she's, she's kind of found her little niche there. Um, I have a, another student who I was hoping he could come today, uh, Terrence, he is a senior now in high school and um, is due to actually take his check right in the next week or two. Uh, he received scholarship through the Antique Plane Association, which, which kind of gave him a little boost and helped with some of that training. And uh, he is actually uh, looking towards going Air Force, so uh, having this private pilot license beforehand will be a nice thing. Uh, but um, uh, teaching, I still do very a little bit on the side because there's nothing like giving someone that first experience of Ooh, you're no longer on the ground anymore. It, there's nothing that there's nothing to compare with that. And uh, I still love teaching the primary because soloing someone for the first time is as much of a thrill for me as it is for them and to see their the absolute excitement on their faces uh, when they get out of that plane going, wow, I, I did it all myself, I can't believe it. And it's, it's really quite a, quite a, quite a joy. So, go ahead. Do you have time for Sure. Does your daughter have anything? Oh, well, she you know she has a, some. She can share some stories. Of, <laughs> she, I share a first solo stories. Uh, with you. My daughter has a very interesting first solo story, or first solo cross country story, excuse me, your cross country. Yeah, so up, keep in mind, uh, Leah's, uh, uh, my husband, is uh, an air traffic controller. He works, uh, he used to work at a lot of the towers and then worked at what we call SoCal Approach. So that's the radar 
that, that controls all the planes from the border to around Santa Barbara. Okay? His specific airspace was LA arrivals. Okay? But it's all housed in the same building. Okay? And that's right here by um, uh, Miramar, okay? is, is the trade con. So as much as he's controlling the aircraft going into LAX, He's also right next to the guy who's controlling perhaps the, 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 the planes going into John Wayne or the planes going into Ontario. And so um, one, of the, one of the things we teach our pilots, our student pilots, we use it all the time, we call it VFR flight following. So you get up there. If we had VFR flight following in my day, maybe I would not have taken, <laughs> I, might have, I might have made my left hand turn. Um, but they're just tracking you. They, they, you, you tell them I'm going from A to B at this altitude, and they track you, and they see. And if there's a, other planes coming, they'll give you traffic advisories. They'll say, hey, you know, traffic 3 o'clock, and, and they'll look out for you. But basically, it's just another set of eyes on you as you traverse from one area to the other. So my husband was well aware of Leah going on her first cross country. Yeah. So. I, I was changing frequencies, and you always have to touch base with the new controller that you're talking to. And I'm sure I sounded extremely timid, probably a little frightened too on the frequency, so he recognized me right away. And uh, so I make my call, and he replies back, uh, I hear you got a messy room. I'm playing like, oh my gosh, why does he know I have a messy room? What? And another plane that was flying, you know, a beanie a couple miles away was like, hey, my daughter's got a messy room too. And so for 30 seconds on the frequency, no calls were made, and it was all about my messy room because my dad had known that I was going to be flying that day, and this controller was getting a kick out of mortifying me on the radio. But I don't even remember what my comeback was. Like, yeah, but I get good grades. <laughs> but it was, uh, it's been, uh, it's crazy to have friends and be like, yeah, my mom's a pilot and so is my dad. He's an air traffic controller and you take it for granted or you just kind of get desensitized to it. But uh, it's really kind of an amazing thing. It's funny though, I'm still deadly afraid of heights. I cannot, you can get me up on a ladder and that's about it. But a plane I'm just desensitized to, so. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions, please? A couple of questions. Um, have you uh, considered or have you tried Rotary wing as opposed to fixed wing? Oh, um, wow, I would love to. Uh, all it is is, is is I needed someone to bankroll it for me. <laughs> yeah, I had to make a decision. And helicopter uh, flight training is, e civilian, is even more expensive than fixed wing. It's about double. So when you're paying 100 for a fixed wing, you're paying 200 for, for your um, for your helicopter, so it, 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 it takes it out of the picture uh, for being totally realistic. I'm, I'm curious, uh, Julie, why is that? I thought a helicopter would be cheaper. Well, I, you know, I think the heli how much is a little helicopter? You're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can buy a 172 for $40,000 and insure it for $40,000, as opposed to the helicopter that is gonna cost you, I, I don't really know, 500,000 a mil for a helicopter, and you're going to have to insure it for that. And then you have the liability and blah, 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 blah. So it just insurance is what right, what keeps the cost also of, of, of this flight training. So, it's nice. so my second question is, uh, this earlier this week, we heard about the, an instructor um, here plane crash in Santee. Do you have a, in, any insight as to, or speculation as to what happened? You know, um, I, at this point, it's so early in the game, uh, it, 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 it's kind of painful, and it's such, a, such an amazingly sad occurrence. Um, we, we know, and I'm sure you've read in the paper, that perhaps this plane has had issues in the past. Um, so, but, uh, you know, I hate to speculate on, on what was going on in the minds of the instructor uh, and the student when that engine quit on them. And Gillespie, you know, I fly out of all the airports because I examine out of all the airports, I won't lie. Gillespie's not my favorite one because there's just no options. You are landing on a freeway or a road uh, and 
and, and then you've got to take into consideration that most of those roads are going to have um, wires, telephone, high tension, whatever. So you just, you know, Ramona, at least we have cow fields. I like that. That's, that's okay. Um, but um, you have just a matter of seconds to decide what you're going to do and when you're that low. And if you hesitate those few seconds, the plane is, is, is probably out of, out of control at that point. So um, I'm sure that the, um, it'll, it'll be a while that the MTSB will, will come up with its findings and tend to be uh, spot on. So. And we had the bid air at, uh, at, at Brown, which is another uh, really heart-wrenching experience. Uh, as far as teaching goes, whenever you're operating in the uh, control, in the, in the traffic pattern of an airport, it is the pilot's responsibility to see and avoid. That's their responsibility. Um, the controller really only has a responsibility of making sure that the runways um, are, are, are clear or, or not. But everything out in the space is it's up to the pilot. So um, there, there's a lot of um, yeah, it was a, just a lot of uh, un you know, unfortunate, that perfect moment put together, right? Are there any other questions? Well, I'm going to ask one more thing. Sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, um, in, in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> yeah. So, how's the traffic handled between uh, the, the military forces and the civilian control, the FAA type? Well, How do you handle traffic from Maryland? Yeah, you know, the, the airspace is very, it, it, it is black and white. Um, the airspace is, has its dimensions laterally and vertically. And, and, and like for Miramar, you, you can't get into that airspace. You can ask, and they'll say, okay, but at this very specific altitude, you can go through. I flew over Miramar three days ago. Well, we flew over at 3,500 feet, okay? And we can, you know, watch the watch the planes landing underneath us. So it is tightly controlled, but still available, if that makes sense. So again, just like Lindbergh, uh, you cannot fly over uh, in Lindbergh's airspace, but you can ask for permission. And again, the controllers, because they are they they literally controlling the movement of all those planes in that specific airspace so they can go, okay, you can go right along there, you're going to be fine. Um, there are corridors. Lindbergh does have, we call it a VFR corridor, so we don't necessarily have to talk to anybody. And we can literally go right over the middle of Lindbergh, uh, but at a very specific altitude, and, and then down uh, the Silver Strand and, and then meet up with Brown Field. So, the airspace is very clearly defined, well spelled out, and there's some airspace that you can go into without talking to anybody, and then other airspace that you must have permission. <coughs> <coughs> well, yes, sir. Are you seeing a lot of interference from drones yet? <coughs> well, you know, yes. Uh, I had a student pilot on the cross country a month ago going, yeah, there was a drone. You know, she could see it. How big are drones that she's able to see this? Um, I had the count, but um, forget now. But uh, so many, uh, all whether it's airliners or just private people, are having these spottings of these drones. Which, to me personally, uh, I'm thinking the FAA really has to wake up on this one and and get a little bit more control on this because anybody can go out and buy those things, right? Now, surely we have a regulation. Oh, don't fly, don't fly it around an airport. Okay, well, if you're not a pilot, are you going to know that? Because you just went over to Radio Shack or on the Amazon and bought your drone. You see? And so uh, people have the capability of buying these things, flying these things, and really aren't aware of, of the rules and regulations around them. Um, I think it's a big threat on the horizon. It, 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 and I, I hope that it, we don't I hope that the FAA acts before uh, an engine eats one up and, 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 and uh, has a, you know, an unfortunate outcome. So, yeah. All right.
Thank you very much. Well, listen, let's